This is the CBS Sunday Night News. Bill Plant reporting. Good evening. A British Midland Airways 737 bound for Belfast has crashed near Nottingham, about 100 miles north of London, while trying to make an emergency landing. Of the 126 people aboard, at least 33 are reported dead. The airline says the problem was engine failure. Tom Fetton reports. The Boeing 737 crashed just short of the airport. It hit an embankment on the M1, England's main north-south highway, and broke into several pieces. There was heavy traffic on the highway at the time. The plane broke into three large pieces. Wreckage was strewn over the highway. Eyewitnesses described the crash. You saw the plane. He was obviously not going to make it. We saw the lights. He saw he literally hit the trees here. Big flash of light. And we realized that he pancaked short, but we didn't realize he dropped on the motorway. After the plane took off from London's Heathrow Airport for Belfast, the pilot reported an engine problem and difficulty in climbing. He requested permission to divert to the East Midlands Airport near Nottingham before disappearing from the radar screen. Eyewitnesses say some of the survivors walked or crawled away on their own. The first person I saw was a steward walking around. Um, he, he just didn't know what was happening. A number were trapped in the wreckage. 10 to 20 persons still trapped in the wreckage of the aircraft. A priest on the scene administered the last rites to the dying. A surprising number of passengers survived and were taken by a fleet of ambulances to nearby hospitals. The Boeing 737 was a new plane. British Midland Airways said it was delivered only 12 weeks ago. The crash comes two and a half weeks after the Lockerbie disaster, the worst in British aviation history. Tom Fenton, CBS News, London. At the Conference on Chemical Weapons in Paris, a surprise pledge from the Soviets to begin dismantling their own stockpile. Also, continuing pressure from the U.S. on the subject of what it says is a major chemical weapons plant in Libya. Wyatt Andrews has our report. Schultz gave the Soviets a highly unusual 10-minute briefing on the Libyan chemical factory. The idea is to enlist Foreign Minister Shevardnadze in an effort to stop Gaddafi. He said that he would, he would uh, look into it. I forget his exact phraseology, but I have no doubt he'll be asking questions. The Soviets, meanwhile, had an agenda of their own, an announcement they will begin to eliminate their massive chemical weapons stockpile sometime this year. Schultz said the U.S. welcomed that announcement, while other U.S. officials scurried to claim the Soviets were just playing catch-up ball, that the U.S. has been destroying parts of its stockpile since 1982. At the conference itself, Iraq clashed with Israel. As the Iraqi foreign minister complained that Israel owned nuclear weapons, Israel's chief delegate wrapped his nameplate on the table for attention and then denounced the Iraqis for using chemical weapons. Despite all of that, a promise by all of the 140 nations which have come here never again to use chemical weapons remains the likely outcome of this meeting. Arab diplomats say today's accusations against Israel were just a bit of standard Middle East business and not an attempt to scuttle the conference. Wyatt Andrews, CBS News, Paris. Still ahead on the CBS Sunday Night News, an epidemic of Super Bowl fever breaks out in Cincinnati and San Francisco. Out of the hospital tonight, and tomorrow he'll be back at work with a bandage on one hand and a budget in the other. Jacqueline Adams reports. President Reagan returned to the White House a day after surgery to straighten his left ring finger. How are you feeling? Uh, Though he'll spend the rest of his presidency recuperating, aides say Mr. Reagan intends to keep busy. Tomorrow, he'll submit his final budget to Congress, although even Republicans have already dismissed it. It'll be a good starting point for George Bush. The Congress will not consider the Reagan budget very seriously. The $1 trillion budget does not raise taxes, and its $95 billion deficit falls under the legally mandated target. Mr. Reagan wants more money for AIDS research as well as the Pentagon. To pay for it, he wants to do away with 80 federal programs. But Congress has rejected those proposals before. Not even the president-elect is wildly enthusiastic. When the ball is in my court and the buck is stopping on my desk, I may have something else to say about matters. Both Mr. Bush and congressional leaders know the real bargaining will begin once the new president submits his budget blueprint. In the meantime, Mr. Reagan plans to spend this, his final full week in office, saying goodbye to his friends, his staff, and in a Wednesday night Oval Office speech to the nation. 
Jacqueline Adams, CBS News, the White House. And as the president gets ready to leave town, he's urging the House and Senate to take a hike. They may just take him up on it, as Deborah Potter reports. The proposal for a 50% salary hike, raising congressional pay to $135,000 a year, has already become a hot political issue on Capitol Hill. Congressional pay adjustments have become a perpetual source of debate, controversy, and frankly of embarrassment to the members of Congress. Members of Congress should uh, read the lips of our constituents and just say no to a congressional pay increase. President Reagan has urged Congress to say yes, raising not only their own salaries, but those of federal judges and executives. And members of the outside commission that recommended the raise say it's essential to begin making up for the damage inflation has caused over the past 20 years. There are federal judges who are leaving because federal judicial salaries are so far below the legal job market. There are at NIH senior research jobs which have been vacant for 10 years because the salary structure is so far below the job level. The pay hike will take effect in 30 days unless both houses of Congress reject it. And as things stand now, that seems unlikely. Deborah Potter, CBS News, Washington. Japan's new emperor made his first public appearance today. Emperor Akihito met with the prime minister and other Japanese government officials at the imperial palace. He pledged to seek world peace during his reign. Next month, Akihito will preside over the funeral of his father, Emperor Hirohito, who died of cancer at age 87. Soviet cargo planes are flying to Seattle this week to pick up prefabricated shelters. Volunteers built them for the homeless of Armenia, just one of the ways Americans are contributing to the earthquake relief effort, as Betsy Aaron reports. They look like ordinary tourists these Armenian government officials on their first trip to the United States. A trade mission planned before the earthquake makes this visit more critical now. In Washington, a meeting with George Bush, a ceremony at the Red Cross, and a tale of help which saved one of two brothers. The younger one was able to, be, uh, uh, to stay alive because of all the medical supplies and the medical equipment that the American Red Cross had sent us. More than a month after the earthquake, hands continue to reach out to Armenia. In Walnut, California, today is a day of giving. In a hangar in Boston, medical supplies await shipment. And in a New York restaurant, the Armenians talk with Hirar Huvnanyan, New Jersey real estate developer, back from a visit to Armenia. I it looked like I lost my whole family, and it was very, very hard for me to take. And, um, and I felt, I felt that when I get back, I'll do everything that I can to bring the East-West relationship together. Puvnanian's already given a million dollars. Now he's working to put together a master plan for rebuilding. The immediate need is over 100,000 housing units. Next Sunday, the official 40-day mourning period comes to a close. Far too short a time for the mourning to end and the rebuilding to begin. Betsy Aaron, CBS News, New York. Well, football fans are celebrating tonight in the Queen City and in the city by the bay. Their teams scored big victories today, and they're headed for the Super Bowl. Frank Courier reports. A 21-10 conference title win over Buffalo today brought down the house in an explosion of Bengal mania at Cincinnati. We are going to be number one. In a countdown to victory, 49er fans in San Francisco were cheering too. Their team embarrassed the Bears in their own bone-chilling backyard. Chicago, I'm sorry, you know, you thought you had it, but bye-bye. A brutal wind chill of 33 below at Soldier Field, what many predicted would be bear weather, proved an advantage to the 49ers and quarterback Joe Montana, who dominated Chicago 28-3. We backed off a little bit and we came into the game fresh. I'll tell you what, those five guys up in front of me deserve a whole lot of credit because they played a good front four today and played well. 
The Bengals unbeaten at home this season in what fans like to call the jungle. Out hustled Buffalo behind star rookie running back Icky Woods. We have so much to be proud of, and I'll tell you, especially after last year, to come back and be this victorious, it's been, oh, I can't even tell you, Mott. I'm just so happy for everybody on the team. For only the second time this decade, the Bengals are on a Super Bowl safari, and Cincinnati is ecstatic. It's been a long game time, but it's about time. For the 49ers, who hadn't won a playoff road game in 18 years, the victory ensures another Super Bowl showdown with the Bengals, whom they beat seven years ago. A Miami rematch, which tonight has both sides dancing in the streets. Frank Trier, CBS News, Chicago. That's the CBS Sunday Night News. I'm Bill Plant. See you on the White House, Pete. Good night. I'm Kathleen Sullivan. All this week, CBS This Morning will be examining the Reagan years, how history will judge his presidency. Also, Gene Hackman and the Judds will join us on CBS This Morning. This is CBS. Channel 11 asked...